Well, hello everyone. This is uh, week three. This is Tom, and I uh, appreciate all that you are doing for the class and all of your classes and everything that's going on. I know it's a busy time, so thanks for all of your effort and all your dedication to all that you do. All right, for chapter five and chapter six, we kind of move into a little bit of interactionism, sort of symbolic interactionist perspective as applied to individuals, groups, and then also think about a little bit about culture and social structure, a little bit of continuation or application from chapter three and four, uh, but dive pretty much into the micro level perspective uh, for chapter five, chapter six. So I'm just going to lay out for in about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, lay out some main ideas just to kind of get you oriented around the chapter and uh, kind of talk about a few different things. Um, in sociology, we have the micro level perspective and then the macro level perspective and it's really about seeing the interrelationships between between the two uh, the macro level theories are functionalism and conflict theory they deal with on the side of functionalism uh, structures and institutions uh, you know you have structures they have functions uh, society is viewed as a problem solving entity uh, so if we have um, particular issues going on within our communities or particular problems we develop institutions to help address those particular problems Maybe an example I'll start to think about is uh, the development of our foster care system goes uh, a long way back to Charles Loring Brace, if you want to read about him a little bit. And the orphan trains got started in the 1800s, a uh, time period of industrialization. And in inner cities, there was a lot of challenges with, uh, with youth who were, you know, there was no child labor laws at the time. Uh, so, so youth were working, they were dislocated from families sometimes, and what to do with kids who are basically some of them roaming the streets and uh, that was a problem that people were identifying. So they started what was called the orphan trains and moving kids from the inner city and being placed in a home in the Midwest predominantly uh, to work on farms. And there's all kinds of fascinating issues to kind of explore with, uh, with the orphan train and the development of the foster care system. So the idea of functionalism is about functions and institutions, about the institutions that we have are a reflection of our cultural values and, and, um, and those kind of things. Conflict theory is another macro level theory. It's looking at big picture pieces, looking at structures and institutions, but having an eye on how institutions and structures benefit uh, those who are in decision making positions or those who have political and social power. Um, Karl Marx was very critical of the system of capitalism he wasn't an anti-capitalist. I think it's sometimes misunderstood. I think he's offering a critique of how a system of social structure of a capitalist system, uh, if it's not contained and controlled and regulated, that it uh, definitely it benefits uh, those who are in positions of power and influence, who exercise a lot of control over how systems operate, uh, the, the ideas that we have within society itself, the conditions of society, and there's differential rewards based on where you are in the hierarchy in the system. And then finally, the micro level where we'll spend time is in the chapter five and six is the human interaction, day-to-day -day life stuff, and also thinking about how ideas come to us. So we'll get from the individual to group all the way into social structure and how social structure and ideologies or beliefs or values kind of trickle down through institutions and uh, become part of the way that we think, the way that we behave, and the way that we respond to the world. It's important to keep in mind that a sociological perspective or social sciences in general does not see that anything in the human world is natural, that things that happen in the human world are there because of things, because of, of uh, uh, because people and actors and technology and science, that things have kind of moved in, in, in different directions and different ways to create this environment that we are in. So nothing is natural. Everything has been kind of either conditioned or put into play. So things are open for change. Um, so related points, the micro level perspective, a couple of things. One of them is this social construction of reality, which is a really key idea. I, I encourage you to look around for some other videos to kind of explain the social construction of reality. We've talked a little bit about it before, I think, last week. And the, the general idea is that um, the meanings that we have, the ideas that we have, the, the the world operates around a uh, the ideas that we have and that we carry. They come from institutions and individuals in day-to-day -day life. We start to develop ideas. We construct these realities. So I'll give you an example that maybe kind of helped to kind of clarify. Uh, race is is one at one time was viewed as biologically determined. That we believe that there was these discrete biological races. Uh, there's more recognition now, starting probably 40, 50 years ago, more and more recognition and awareness that 
uh, biological categories of race were actually human constructions and that race is a social construct. Um, if you want to go back and kind of give you a couple different illustrations, there's a period of time where the Irish uh, in the United States were not viewed as being white. They're viewed as being a racial other. There's a term called the black Irish uh, where the blacks were not only uh, or that the Irish were not only viewed as non-white or and they were also viewed as some of them were viewed as also the black Irish. Uh, there's a political editorial cartoon during the 18, late 1880s, during a time period when uh, we erected or started the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first federal law prohibiting the immigration of a particular racial group or a particular ethnic group, and that's the, the Chinese. And um, that had to do with a very, you know, that editorial cartoon, you can look it up, you can see it, it's just sort of like Chinese Exclusion Act, editorial cartoon, Chinese, um, Irish, and you'll see an image of the Chinese and a black Irish and they're eating Uncle Sam, that they're going to devour and uh, take over America. This is a constructed reality. This is the, you know, the Irish were immigrating. They're, they were Catholic. They were non-Protestant. This was, a, this was a, a challenge and a threat to some. And they constructed, there was a, a constructed reality about who the Irish were. We recognize today, I mean, that to say that the Irish aren't white today would be kind of an absurd thought. So it tells you that the meaning that we have of things, they move and change across time. Another real quick example is thinking about gender. Gender is a social construct. What does it mean in terms of to be male, to be masculine, to be feminine, to be, to be um, to, uh, female? What are the gender constructs? What are the ideas, the beliefs, the values? What are the expectations? These things change and move across culture and time and place. Uh, they are constructed realities. Transgender. You know, new language, new category that we, you know, using more and more frequently today and more comfortable talking about the transgender community. This is a reflection of a, a socially constructed reality that's altering and it's changing. And it's, I would argue that it's more reflective of the ways in which we operate. And it's more egalitarian in that regard um, than a time period when transgender community was misunderstood, marginalized, and oftentimes demonized. Um, can okay, kind of shift a little bit. That's kind of the social construction of reality perspective. Talk about a couple different, I think, fascinating ideas about the interactionist micro level perspective um, ideas and theories. One of them is Irving Goffman and his work. He did a lot of work in the symbolic interactionist tradition. One concept talked about in the book is this idea of dramaturgy. So drama, it's about, about performance. And uh, it's, it's about humans are engaged in the process of dramaturgy in everyday life. That's what we do. So think about the language of drama and think about the langu language of performance as if you were an actor. So you have a script. You have a setting. You have, uh, you have clothes that you wear. You have ways of marking yourself in terms of who you are. You have speech patterns. You have language, the way that you communicate. All these are ways of demonstrating performance. Think about the occupations that you're going into and the expectations that go along with the, with the performance of that particular role. Uh, if you're going into law enforcement, for example, there's a lot of dramaturgy that's operating in terms of law enforcement, ranging from you know, the, the, the uniform that law enforcement officers wear, uh, the demeanor of the law enforcement officer. Um, it's a helping to establish position and authority. Um, so sometimes the dramaturgy is essential and it's an important part of the overall structure. Um, Kind of give you a, another another example uh, outside of occupational roles. It's thinking about just sort of going to the grocery store and, and just looking around and seeing how we are basically performing and when we're standing in line, when we greet the uh, the cashier, how we engage in that interaction. These are learned behaviors and they're about role performance. I think Goffman's kind of analysis is not that that we have one you know we have multiple sides of ourselves or multiple aspects of ourselves and we change based on the context that we are in. So that doesn't make us, um, you know, less real in certain con contexts or more real in others. It just means that we understand and we're learning the rules of how to engage in particular social systems. So it's all about this fascinating idea about, about dramaturgy. When I worked as a clinical social worker, uh, I remember working with a client one time and I went down to pick him up from the, from the office or from the meeting room uh, or the waiting room and he came back to my office and I told all my clients, I said, you know, sit, sit where you're most comfortable while, you know, while we did the intake and asked them questions about sort of why they were there and all that kind of stuff. And when he came into the office, most often my office was situated where I had my desk and then there were some chairs and then there was a couch and there was a table. 
Uh, most, most oftentimes, uh, individuals sat at the couch or they sat uh, at the chair next to the desk. He came into the office and he sat in my chair. Uh, that was the first and only time that ever happened. I thought, well, this is fascinating. He violated the script. He violated sort of the conditions of what, what was expected. Uh, I carried on. I just sat in the other chair and just went through the process. And I found out he was uh, seeking treatment for assaultive behavior and antisocial personality related things. And I was like, oh, okay. I can kind of see he's got a lot of power and control issues. And this is one way that he uh, demonstrated that. So kind of another example of dramaturgy. Um, a couple studies that you'll read, and you can find some, I put a couple of video links up that you can, you can watch uh, that are fascinating. Uh, one of them is Ash's study in conformity. Uh, and I think it's really kind of important to think about when Ash is talking about conformity, think about two different things. There's a conformity to the group, and then there's informational conformity. So sometimes we're in situations we conform to the group. Uh, you know, all of a sudden we're, let's say we're at a concert, People start, we're sitting down, everybody's sitting down, people start to stand. Like, you know, okay, I wanted to stand, but then all of a sudden other people start to stand. There may be kind of like, give me encouragement to go ahead and stand myself. That's about group conformity. Now there's informational conformity where sometimes we'll actually change our mind based on what the group says. So keeping that kind of separated out, the sort of idea that the group exerts an influence, we change who we are versus the group has an influence that we want to become a member of the group or kind of uh, comply with what's going on within the group. Ash's analysis and, uh, you know, and a lot of stuff out of social science is that humans are, you know, we, are, we want to have membership into groups. We seek membership. The more important that that group is to us, the more likely we are to conform. It doesn't make us less human. That actually humanizes us. That becomes part of, part of we, who we are. That's a good thing. The challenge becomes one is sometimes we're in situations or the context is exerting the group pressure that's there is actually counterproductive to a person's well-being or to the well-being of other people within a group. Think about within middle school and high schools, there's a lot of work done about how to break through some of the challenges with uh, conformity that goes on that's, uh, that's toxic sometimes and counterproductive. Um, but it's, I think it's important to want to emphasize that conformity is not bad in and of itself. Um, Conformity is a natural human expression. Uh, there's a Stanford prison experiment. I'll provide a link to that. Uh, you can go through their webpage and kind of see that, you know, that experiment. Fascinating sort of demonstration about how context um, changes behavior. Uh, you can change context and behavior changes. This is one of the a foundational and important study to, write, to look at in thinking about um, our prison system and how the prison system, the setting itself, may actually promote certain types of behavior. Um, I think it's fascinating if you do a comparison of the Nordic, uh, Norwegian prison system and how it's structured. It's structured in a way that's much more humanizes that particular population, the prison population. And the behavior that follows is transformative. It's much more pro-social behavior than within our prison system, which tends to be much more anti-social behavior uh, within the system itself. So the social setting becomes really important. Now we're going to move to, the last few minutes here, move to a, sort of a bigger level picture. And when you're reading about the different types of societies, I think it's fascinating uh, to look through about how we move from communities of hunting and gathering to the development of horticulture and pastoral societies to agrarian societies about five, 7,000 years ago. We started to move towards cities. It's the first time we ever, ever did that as far as humans. Uh, then 1700s, 1800s, industrialization, and then starting this 1970s, uh, post-industrial world. So the recognition of thinking about these different social structures, these social systems, is this transformation that goes on uh, within our communities as we experience um, new social structures. I think we're in a fascinating, unique, challenging time period. You know, the way the technology is interfacing in our day-to-day -day lives, we're in a postmodern world. It's a lot different than the one that was in the 1970s now. Um, we are, you know, with, with robotics and artificial intelligence and the way that, that media and the way that technology is now interfacing more and more in our lives, it's transforming not only ourselves, but our social relations, the context, expectations, so many different things that are going on. And the root is a lot of ways it's that, that change that goes on with technology that helps facilitate that. And there's a whole branch of theory. There's a whole branch of, of, of philosophy dealing with the issue of or addressing how technology has that kind of impact. If you ever heard of uh, Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel, it's kind of that idea. 
Uh, Gerald Linsky in sociology, he was one that kind of we'll talk about later on, talking about globalization, who talked about the role of technology in shaping societies. And lastly is a concept of uh, McDonaldization by George Ritzer. Uh, it's, I think it's valuable to recognize that George Ritzer, a contemporary sociologist, is talking or, or using the ideas of Max Weber, a sociologist from uh, their early 1900s, mid-1900s, who wrote a lot about the rational society, the technological society, the development of bureaucracy came out of sort of Max Weber's ideas. Max Weber was both saw the value of technology, of what it can do for societies, and also recognized that technology and science and an increased rational order can be very dehumanizing and, and, and um, disenchanting. Um, and I just sort of really appreciate the example or one example of thinking about cities back in, let's say, 1200s, 1300s, 1400s Europe. The tallest building in a city was a place of worship. Um, it was enchanted. You walk into one of those cathedrals and it's, it's a spiritual experience. Um, it, it connotes a lot about this world outside of our world. It's an enchanting place. Um, you, know, you look at our, the tallest buildings in cities today, of course, there, it's finance, it's industry. This is a representation of sort of where we are as a culture. These places that, you know, like the business and banking and industry, they're all systems of rational, they're all rational-based uh, ba rational systems. So it's a major transformation in that way. And, Max, and uh, George Ritzer takes the idea and applies it to this idea of McDonaldization of society, the idea that more and more of our things that are going on have been McDonaldized. So it's not just fast food or it's not just food, it's our vacations have been McDonaldized. The ways that we consume media have been McDonaldized. Um, I didn't even, you know, I brought this, I was like, okay, here's a, a prop to show, sort of thinking about both the social construction of reality, thinking about our teeth. Our teeth, we've constructed a reality around teeth, like straight white teeth. And if you can see us here, it's like when I, you know, I have sensitive teeth, so I, I bought this, you know, uh, Sensodyne teeth, pro enamel, but it's this gentle whitening. Uh, white teeth is a relatively recent phenomena, ten, last 10 years, I would say. Do a quick search and type in white teeth uh, or put in a white teeth toothpaste or something like that. And the images you'll see, you'll see almost all women. And I think that's fascinating in of itself, too. It's like, huh, these products are, are, of course, available to anyone in the community, but how we're marketing and advertising, we're constructing a reality about, about teeth. And that starts to enter the way that we think about ourselves, the way we think about others. It maybe even influence social status and position or all these different kind of things. That's also about McDonaldization, is that we're, this, this, we're McDonaldizing uh, we're McDonaldizing our teeth in a way, right? Straight teeth, white teeth. It's sort of this uniform, predictable sort of fashion around teeth. Wow, that was a lot. Um, but I hope you enjoyed sort of just an overview of some major concepts I wanted to sort of put out there for you. Um, I hope you enjoy the readings. Check out those supplemental videos. Uh, if you're ever interested in finding out more about a particular area, drop me an email. I'd be more than glad to share some additional resources. I wish you a wonderful week. And uh, yeah, hope things are going well and I'll see you soon.